Good day, everyone, and welcome to our great conversation we're having on this webinar today, Value Stream Management and DevOps. We're talking about predictions for 2022. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm uh, pleased to be your host and uh, kicking things off here. We've got a wonderful group of, uh, of uh, experts, panelists with lots of ideas and thoughts that I'm sure they're anxious to share with us. And uh, we want you to engage with us too. So be sure and check out the chat feature and uh, jump in there. Uh, I know our moderator, Helen Beal, will be uh, engaging with you on that in just a moment. moment. We want to thank Plutora, who is our sponsor for today's webinar. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording. So we, uh, we will send out an email with a link to that recording. So you can jot down some notes or you can go back and listen to it, whatever is uh, most helpful to you. A lot of stuff I think will happen very quickly. I'm kind of, that's my prediction. There'll be a lot of good information here in this, in this session. So please engage with us on chat. So let's move to our topic again, value stream management and DevOps, thinking about predictions for 2022. My great pleasure to introduce this illustrious group of people who I know pretty well, <laughs> a lot of good folks here. Uh, first is Tracy Bannon. Trace, good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Jack Marr, Jack, good to see you as well. Uh, Jeff uh, Kais, good to see you, Jeff, as always. And of course, Helen Beal. Helen, I'm gonna hand the, the baton to you unless you run the, the rest of the marathon, if you, if you will. Perfect with my co-runners with our what with the relay team is that what we are I think yes yep I'm <laughs> um, all doing bits and pieces together so let's talk about what we're going to talk about today so we're going to summarize some of the 2021 research and findings have a look at what people said was going to happen um, over the last year and see if that has happened we'll talk about the latest ways to connect to DevOps tool chains and why value stream management leads to higher performing organizations and what we expect so our crystal ball gazing of what we think is going to happen in the coming year um, we do answer questions live throughout these webinars you can put them in the chat or in the q a um, lovely to see you all chatting um, in the chat box already hey magic lovely to see you i'm glad that some people have got some sunshine <coughs> and nice and warm for you as well so that's good so we're going to start with these reflections we're actually going to start by having a look at uh, the state of agile report so the 14th state of agile report which was from 2020 and then the 15th we saw coming out this year and VSM adoption is rising, or is it? So if you look closely at these graphs, you'll actually see that it looks pretty static. So Tracy, kick us off. Do you <laughs> think, <laughs> is this real? Is this what you're saying? And if it is, why don't we think anything has changed in the last year in terms of VSM? Uh, part of it is that we're still churning on definitions. We're still trying to understand what these things are. We didn't do well with doing DevOps, right? We did, we're going to do Agile, we're going to do DevOps, and now we're going to do VSM. And helping to tie together what value stream, architecting, value stream design, understanding value is kind of first and foremost. I think that's a re big reason why we're not seeing there be more expansion in this area yet, because there's still so much upskilling that needs to happen, rapid upskilling on that. Jack, do you have any other thoughts? I can see you nodding, so I'm sure you agree I, with Tracy. I do. I agree with I agree with what Tracy has said. I, I think there are a couple of things that are pushing this, right? So value stream mapping has been around for 50 years um, and has been thoroughly adopted in, in uh, manufacturing uh, situations. Mm -hmm. But elsewhere, not so much. And I think if we look back at the last 18 months, um, we have a lot of pressure now that can be relieved using value stream mapping, right? So one of the silver linings is a refocus on what we're doing and how we're doing it and the value we deliver and the values that we espouse, right? So mm -hmm. I think those are all coming together in an interesting way. So if there's a if there's a silver lining to what we've been experiencing, it is the pressure to you know make that real, uh, that, that we can't assume things work uh, yeah. the way we thought they did in the past. So understanding how those value streams work um, and and through that um, seeing the opportunities for collaboration so I, I think it's been stalled um, for a handful of reasons you know the the tools have been hard to work with it's been hard to maintain now we've got much better tools we've got a better focus and, and people are starting to understand why this is important so I, I think we'll see adoption really rise I think there's also another piece to that 
And that is value stream mapping, value stream um, processes, the way that we've done that in the past, it could be a science fair project. Like if one of the things that I often have to talk to folks about is to say, this is not your daddy's value stream mapping. This is not a six month um, science fair project. We can right size this in the same way that we right size other things when we're talking about software delivery, the same way when we talk about DevOps, the same way when we talk about Agile. It's not letting perfect get in the way of good. Um, that will also help us. You're right about the tools. So tools, language, and trying to make it sized to what the effort is. You can do this at a really high level and we'll get into that. But you can do it at a super high level and just get some indicators of where you need to double down as opposed to, I'm sure you've been part of a Lean Six Sigma value stream map effort. You know, you're locked in, locked in for, for many days or many weeks or many months. And there's a whole lot of information that comes out, but not without so much pain that people shy away. Talking of language, Jeff, a mapping and management moving at different speeds. Yeah, you know, and, and there is a connection, but uh, it, 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 it could be a relatively loose coupling. Um, I, I think the real key, though, is that by beginning to think about value to begin with, then starting to understand how that works and mapping is, is one tool to do that, mm -hmm. it positions you then to be able to manage, right? And so once we see it, once we understand it, we really have no choice but to begin to, to manage it. And, and that's where I think the emergence of, of tools and a refocus on, on process that is not as painful as we've experienced in the past, that can be maintained um, and, and managed on an ongoing basis. And, and so I think you're right, Helen, we've finally emerged with enough um, capability, enough competency mm -hmm. to actually start to talk about value stream management mm -hmm. until we can see it. Uh, measure it, understand it, we can't do that. So it, it's an important uh, emergence, I think, of capability. And I think the uh, management conversation finally is something that truly speaks to the executive, you know, where maybe DevOps and Agile, oh, that's some kind of technology thing that the tech guys do. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start talking management, the focus is on efficiency. And I'll tell you, there ain't an executive in the world that doesn't care about efficiency. And as soon as you give them some levers and some dials to say, I can see efficiency of every pipeline and measure their progress over time, it starts to answer some of the fundamental questions that really as engineering and software development teams, we've never been able to answer really well or consistently. And that is, hey, you know, with all the money we've spent and all the time and effort we've said we're improving, um, are we really doing better? How do we know? Uh, it, yeah. Other than, you know, I spot <laughs> polls and so forth. So um, I think that's where this starts to grow into a whole new conversation because mm -hmm. now the executive's like, wait a minute, I've always wanted to have insights into what's happening. And now people are telling me I should, and you're not giving it to me. Hmm. Okay. But, let's have that. But conversation. Those business insights are so important to both sides. What I'm finding is that when you start to talk about it in the context of delivering value, delivering something out, Right. When I'm working with the Department of Defense and you're talking about what have I delivered to the warfighter, to the soldier, and you talk about it much more specifically that way, it's tangible for business and tech. So there's a this beautiful alignment that happens across both of those um, when you when you start to surface it. Another really sexy part of value streaming, period, whether it's design, delivery, management, is that it is democratizing the information. Right? It's no longer eye pokey that somebody's coming in and saying, you know, your DevOps pipeline, your metrics are really bad. It's laying it out on the table together and allowing the facts to speak for themselves. Jack, you might appreciate this. I was in a conversation this week and the argument was <clears throat> on, on metrics. Um, and, you know, let, let's, let's get what those metrics need to be. Um, and they, honest to goodness, talked about lines of code. LOC, <laughs> LOC delivered. <laughs> I had a little explosion. Can I, can I get a function point? <laughs> yeah, sure. That's <laughs> right. To alert everyone to the new verb that Tracy <laughs> just coined, which is value streaming. To value stream, I value stream, you value stream. So I love that. Um, another bit of research, which actually was repeated in 2021 from 2022, was from Gartner. And they said by 2023, that's the year after next, 70% of organizations will use value stream management to improve flow in their DevOps pipeline. What do we think, Jeff? Are we on target or do we need to hurry up? Or do we need to revive oh. our expectations? 
We definitely need to hear, hurry up. And and there's a little bit of take the data with a grain of salt. I mean, uh, DevOps has been around for 10 years and 50% of development is quote unquote doing DevOps to some level or not. Um, and what I've found is, well, that means they installed Jenkins or they installed <laughs> <Triple> <laughs> <CI>. <laughs> They're well, there. Isn't there so, a maturity model that you could kind of figure out how they're doing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's kind of funny. So depending upon how far they go will be interesting. It I think it's also driven by the idea of cross-functional teams, which is having traction, which companies are doing, but still trying to figure it out. I've, I read one of the um, uh, report outs from one company that is moving towards a product cross-functional organization. And so they were trying to figure it out. They fired a bunch of middle management and said, gosh, now we're going to have cross-functional teams. Oh, wait, we forgot about having a product owner role in Scrum. Uh, let's take the HR folks because we haven't finished firing them yet. We'll make them product owners. So they're, you know, <laughs> are, are they doing it? Yeah, when you read the surveys, um, I, these are true stories, by the way. When you read the surveys, yeah, I think, I think we'll see that people are adopting it. And then what will happen is they'll realize, well, wait a minute, it's not quite working yet. And so we need to upskill, figure it out. But definitely the momentum is there because it has the executive focus and because there's some fantastic promise of actually breaking some of the barriers that exist, getting DevOps unstuck, moving the agile conversation forward, and actually realizing some of the goals that we've always had. Should we check in with our audience and see where they're at with our first poll, which is audience, where are you on the BSM adoption scale? So you have several answers you can choose from. We are expanding our implementation. We have implemented and not expanding. We are currently implementing. We are planning to implement in the next 12 months. We are interested, but not planning to do anything soon. We're not interested. There's a typo there that I missed. I'm not sure where we are at with this. So those are pretty much the answers that we saw in that Agile at Scale survey. So whilst we get in the mood for predictions, Tracy, what do you predict is gonna be the highest answer? Oh, let's see here. I'm going to say it's going to be uh, in between in the middle. Um, it's either in the next 12 months or interested, but not quite planning it yet. Depends yeah. on the industry that they're coming from. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting one. Sorry, back to Tracy for a second. Which mm -hmm. industries are leading in this space? Um, I can tell you the industries that really want to do this are on the on the government side of the house. They want to do this. Um, and they're not necessarily planning on it. They're trying to get their finger on the pulse and figure that out. So I think they're a little far further behind. I think what you're going to see, especially in the financial sector, uh, that you see that they're doing quite a lot with this. Sorry to interrupt you, Jack. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I think I agree with what Tracy's saying. You know, the, the clients that we have uh, that I'm routinely working with right now are in various stages of applying these concepts. And it's, you know, crawl, walk, run. Mm -hmm. um, internally, this is something that we have been doing for a long time and have uh, really built some capability uh, around it. So um, we're at the expansion stage and, and looking to share that with others. That's wonderful. wonderful. I'm going to close that poll and I'm going to, uh, ask if I can uh, Jeff to talk us through those results. So I think Tracy, first off, your prediction came true. Jeff, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, you know, I, it's exactly what I would expect. It's I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> VSM, everybody's talking about it. I got a toaster with VSM. Uh, looks pretty cool. Sounds cool. I should figure out what this is. So let me see what the predictions are. But uh, does it integrate with your Alexa or your Google Home? Right. Exactly. That's okay. the question. You know, so can, can, I, can I pull it from Jira or connect it to other? Yeah. The, those are the conversations that I. And hear what's so the often. metric that you use for it? Which metric do we use? <laughs> so. I, I think people are trying to figure out and trying to figure out why and understand the business justification because it's, you know, from a vendor perspective, hey, I'm a vendor, by the way, um, it's really hot. And that means every vendor under the planet has at some point talked about value stream mapping, value stream management, and it's really cool. So all the vendors are talking about it. And isn't it really cool? We should better, you know, you better go get on this bandwagon because you're going to, you know, FOMO, you're going to miss out. Um, but I don't really know where it's at. And so it, it seems to sort of align with it. Um, not interested is also intriguing because at that point you've heard the toaster doesn't integrate with Alexa and it doesn't bring you any value. I, interestingly enough, um, I hear that until the executive comes and says, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, I really want to know what's going on. How, get more efficient. And are you mm -hmm. focusing on it? How do I know you're focusing on you know, the right things? 
Um, so actually, those two are uh, interesting to me um, and, and really hit. The uh, other, the biggest one is we're planning to implement. Uh, as a vendor, I hear that all the time. Oh, yeah, we're going to get on this right after we get this other project. And as soon as we finish up our, our you know, oh, we're going to get our pipelines there. All the automated tests are going to be in there. And get, you Wait, know, our you mean demo- um, yeah. let perfect get in the way of good? Is that what we're That's saying? That's pretty much it. Okay. I, right. You know, I had an analyst, I won't say who, but as we were talking about some solutions, his quote was, well, it sounds like your solution is to help people with messed up DevOps, to which my response is, <laughs> yes. Well, sort of, but hopefully it's not just that though, right? Right, because right. <laughs> DevOps is, we're talking about solving challenges with software. We're talking about, you know, solving business problems. DevOps is a piece and a part. And Helen is probably going to, here she goes. I go off the deep end of the architecture and engineering part of this and always having tied that to the business. I've always worked with the business as an architect and engineer, but it's been that ability to have that communication, having the lexicon, shared responsibilities that come. You know, that's that's a, a big part. And that culture building that happens when you see your statistics, when you see the flow for your organization, yeah, it, it people either are <laughs> either come together or they really, uh, you know, divest of one another. Mm-hmm. Talking of unsticking DevOps or the impact in DevOps, this is some other research that came out mm-hmm. in 2021. This is Puppet State of DevOps report, and what they were showing here is that we have this kind of frozen middle to adopt a phrase and apply it in completely the wrong way. Um, we have a, a large amount of people that are stagnant; they're struggling to move their DevOps forward or their DevOps journeys forward. Um, and Patrick Tuar finally, after 10 or 12 years, has come up with this definition of what DevOps is, whatever you do to brick, bridge fix, friction created by silos. So that could be our tech silo and our business silo. But mm-hmm. Jack, is DevOps stuck? And if you, so- you know, in a lot of places, it really is. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, for some, re- it, for some interesting reasons, I think. I think there's been a tremendous uptick in the the technical capabilities in a lot of organizations mm-hmm. a lot of folks over the past year and a half you know without having some of the, the the work we would have otherwise done in a lot of cases they've kind of given teams some latitude to go out and and implement devops right so we're mm-hmm. not sure what we're going to do with you over the next six months so why don't you guys go do some devops stuff and then you know we'll we'll, we'll circle back Woo-hoo! together right and, yep. and I'm seeing this in, in all of my clients right now, where teams have taken the initiative, they've solved their local problems, they've implemented pipelines, but it doesn't work well with everybody else. Mm-hmm. And and they're not sure what to do next because they bought the tools, they figured out how to use them, and, and now they need to understand those other parts. So I think VSM really helps with that visibility, that understanding the, the sharing of, of what's going on to make it more visible. And so I think what we're going to see is, is that's going to help people unstick because they'll be able to see where it's stuck. I think there's um, some other realizations that are going to have to come to the surface. A lot of firms, a lot of organizations, a lot of government agencies have kind of outsourced. So now they have a DevOps team over here. So the pipeline is created. I was part of a team recently where they did this. I said, well, wait, I want to know what's going on in the pipeline. That can't, can't and shouldn't be abstracted away, right? So uh, if you're somebody standing there working in a, in a factory, you need to understand the assembly line and your, your place at that and how you impact what's happening on there. So I think that that's a, a, a thing that is stalling us is this sudden uptick in having DevOps teams off on the on the, on the side. Um, I also think there's a, a trend towards a pipeline definition. So we get back into having consistency in our pipelines. I don't know of any firm where they're truly only ever going to have one pipeline that does everything for everybody. There's has to be some reasonable variability. I mean, that's what agility is about is having reasonable variation, right? So those are, those are some other reasons I, I do believe that, that help us understand why it's stuck. And Helen, you know, you work with a lot of teams as well. What are you seeing as why things are stuck? I think it is cultural. I would probably point my finger at organizational design and leadership and say that people are not given the time 
to make improvements. They don't have the autonomy to self-discover. They don't have the leadership to coach them, to self-discover and make those improvements. And they're not arranging themselves around value streams. So they are still operating in silos and they don't understand the end-to-end -end flow of how to get value to their, their customer. So I think we're all singing from the same song sheet, but we can do another little check-in with our audience actually and ask them if they think that DevOps is stuck. So we're gonna do poll two. It is, is your DevOps stuck? Your answers are A, nope, we're flying. B, we haven't started DevOps. Or C, yes, our DevOps is like wading through treacle stroke molasses. If it's none of them, <laughs> you can put a comment in the chat. Um, I'd also like just to comment, thank you, William, and thank you, Paul. I have noted that we have questions from you both waiting in our QA. I am going to wait for a little while because I think there's going to be a more appropriate time to answer them. So bear with us and we will get to them in a while um so let's have a look at that poll um uh, let me see if i can do what i did last time and get that max we can see how that's doing you can see it live moving so actually a really even spread there uh tracy do you want to start doing some anal analysis on this this time yeah let me see i am still not seeing it there we go Oh my, I love that it's, we have got 35% saying that they're flying. Oh gosh. So my heart breaks when I hear somebody say, we haven't, we haven't started at all. Because quite frankly, if you're doing any kind of continuous integration, or, and, and you can define continuous in terms of whatever your time chunks are once a day, well, you're doing a part of DevOps. So I believe that the folks who are saying that they're not, haven't started DevOps, actually have implemented some of the features and capabilities that are under that massive umbrella. Um, and we've been talking about it so far. It is like wading through molasses with most of the areas because of the culture. I'm seeing that again and again. The tech is not the problem here, folks. You, and, and I know that you all know that. It is absolutely the alignment between business and technology and having the open conversations. Jeff, quick question yeah. to you. Do you uh, I'm going to look. I'm going to look at that. We haven't started DevOps a little bit differently than Tracy did. I'm going to look at that. I'm going to be the disgusting optimist that I am. And I'm going to say that this is people who are saying, hey, we might have some tools, but we're not really doing the whole thing yet. So I'm going to go with that, that they are recognizing the missing cultural component. And I think that's a big challenge for a lot of our leaders that, you know, they need to understand that buying DevOps tools air quotes, I hate that, but you know, we know what we mean by that. Buying DevOps tools does not make you a, a, a DevOps practitioner. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're doing it right. So I am going to go with the fact that they're saying, hey, we've dabbled with some tools, but we're ready to move on with the more important pieces. Uh, and, and hopefully the we are flying are those folks that say, hey, you know what? We're not perfect yet. I mean, I haven't seen anybody that's got a fully automated end to end, including all of the components that we would not want to have in a, a, you know, in a perfect world. But, you know, we're making progress, right? One step forward, one bite at a time. We're getting there. If anybody has every one of the bells and whistles and aspects that we've talked about, then they're telling a fib because it's continuously changing. So if they're flying, that means that they've got a certain amount of nimbleness and they're they're consistently learning as they go. That's what it would tell me about the people who are flying. They're learning. They're learning fast. There's a piece to that, too, of, you know, if you haven't started, it means that culture hasn't really internalized yet. If DevOps is about removing the friction and silos between teams, all we're really talking about here is implementing the practices where you reduce that friction, whether that's tools, mm -hmm. culture, what have you. Um, very much, you just need to take a pragmatic approach to this journey and that it is not a journey you're going to arrive. It's forever. You're always going to be looking to improve and you're going to invest some amount of time into that journey, mm -hmm. period question yeah. to you jeff was actually going to be do you think that organizations to need to have achieved a certain level of devops capability before they're ready to look at vsm is it a next generation or a next evolution or can they start wherever oh uh, yeah. my opinion is like blatantly loud of just start now where mm -hmm. you are yeah. be super pragmatic pick an area invest a little bit of time show that you're going to make some improvement yeah. in that and fix it, measure your results, see how you did, 
and rinse and repeat. Just continue this process. It make the culture be experimentation, not we're going to get there when we get there. But get started. But get started. Your point is beautiful. Get started. And get off don't the couch. You're yeah. going to be ahead of everybody else let's, that's still on the couch. And and don't talk in terms of of failure. Um, I'm actually not using the, the fail fast as much anymore. Let's talk about everything in terms of experiments. And you know what the outcome of an experiment is? It's an outcome. And it will, it'll be a result. The outcome of an experiment is a result. And then you evaluate that and figure out from there where it's going to go. Experiments don't fail, right? Experiments just have outcomes. You just aren't always able to predict what those outcomes are. If we start to talk about it in terms of fast experimentation for learning, it takes on a, a different feel for it, and people are more accepting uh, of that jumpstart. We got to get moving. The thing so, that's going to scare people um, is it's another thing that we're starting. We're starting I'm something not, else. Yeah. So let me interrupt you just a second now, because I want to bring in a couple of comments that have come in from the audience. One from Patrice in chat, and one from Paul in the Q and A. So Patrice has said some organisations are still struggling with an agile transformation. Um, and in the Q&A, Paul has said, do you think Agile has helped to make DevOps more stuck as companies can't do accelerated changes in two weeks? I think the answer, uh, Tracy, is kind of where you were just at. Mm -hmm. We're giving these things names where mm -hmm. perhaps we should be looking at approaches. Right. Well, so I have my Agile Transformation Group and I've got the Agile Coaches over here and I've got the DevOps organization over there and I've got some centralized IT and some ops things and I'm trying to bring in my SREs. The problem is we're naming too many things as things without actually having a common lexicon and understanding how they interact with each other. Right? DevOps is not a, a singular thing, right? It is a, a philosophy. It's a mantra. It involves lots of automation and lots of technology, but it's not only technology. Agility is a beautiful front load to that and connects in with it, but they should be wonderfully complementary. But again, Let's track back. Why does value stream matter? Well, I need to deliver something. There's a value that needs to be achieved. The business needs it and tech is going to be a partner in making that happen. What do we need to do? All of these other things become that pragmatic application, right? I mean, I know I sound kind of pie in the sky, but it's simpler than we're making it. We, we, we're having a, here's my agility evaluation. Uh, you know, there's a maturity model to figure out how mature you are with your agility. And then there's one, uh, there are probably, <laughs> I've seen dozens of them around DevOps and what your maturity level is there. So I've got all these measurements to tell me how I'm doing. And yet we're not just taking a step back and breathing and understanding. I need to be able to build this so that these people have this feature, this capability, this new business opportunity. How am I going to do that? Right. Isn't that what we're trying to get at in the end? Indeed. And what we're trying to get at ultimately is high performing organizations. This last bit of research we're going to share in this mm -hmm. section on reflections is from the Valley Stream Management Consortium. And what we're seeing here on the left is that there is a correlation between using these value stream management practices, such as mapping, measuring value, flow, and mm -hmm. outcome. We are seeing that these practices are more prevalent in the high performing organizations. We also see in this research that teams that are aligned to value streams or product or service, and you can say a value stream is anything that delivers a product or a service or has a customer, mm -hmm are twice as likely to be using these kind of flow metrics that we're talking about that we relate to the higher performing organizations. This is exciting to see, and we're hoping to see more trends on this. What other trends, Jeff, would you want to see us find in this sort of research? Um, I think. Oh, Jeff. sorry. No, go, go ahead. No, it's you, Jeff. I'm Jeffrey, and it'll make it easier. <laughs> 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 but usually it's just, hey, you. So that, it's good. Um, I I really hope to see um, a, deeper results of measurement of value of, you know, how do we actually measure value and, and what does that look like in the future as well? Because at the end of the day, that's what a business cares about. And it, it continues to uplevel the conversation. Mm -hmm. The end of the day, there is shouldn't be a differentiation between IT and the business. Right. And looking at the efficiency of the system that supports the business is massively interesting. Well, looking at the outcomes that are also there is, you know, that's the ideal to keep everybody focused on that one goal. When I first did value stream mapping, because, you know, again, it was um, 
not that long ago, just about five years ago, when I first was kind of thinking about that. Um, uh, it was interesting that um, the realization is that the biggest benefit that I saw was not just looking at the inefficiencies, but it brought everybody looking at the same goal. And that's what we got to do as an industry. Yeah. So that's, if I can jump in there, that's exactly where I was going with that, Jeff, is that what's missing from here, what I think really needs to happen is that visibility, the transparency, maybe even get to observability, right? So we're doing all these good things, but to your point, if we're not talking to each other, if we're not aware, then we can't do those things that are going to uh, provide these kind of outcomes, right? So by understanding up, upstream and downstream and, and being a part of that and engaging, you know, things like, um, you know, outcomes become more shared and we have mm -hmm. the opportunity to do better. And this becomes that communications tool and the measurement tool of saying, OK, well, we made some changes. Did it have the expected effect? And getting back to what Tracy was saying earlier, we run these experiments. If it's a predetermined, we know what the outcome is. It's not an experiment. Okay. So we, we should be reaching out there and trying new and different things. Um, with the intent of, of learning. And by making that visible and transparent, I think we can further these and maybe push these elite numbers a little bit bigger. Uh, strong leadership is a, is a big part of this. We've been saying already, it's transparency to whatever the, the goals need to be. Not everybody knows, right? If your development teams, in order for them to rally together, they need a sense of ownership. If they know how they fit into this overall value, yep. whatever, what that is, there's a tremendous amount. So strong leadership and transparency and agreeing on what those values are or all buying in on what that value being delivered is. That's that's the core of all this. All the, all the tech is just the, the beautiful sprinkles on it. Well, Let's and kind of- With our audience again for a moment, if you wouldn't mind, Jeff, I've just started this poll. Which VSM practices do you use in your organization? So you could say you are using value stream mapping. You actively estimate and measure the value impact of each piece of work. We continually inspect the flow of our work items to our customer. We look to see if the outcomes were as expected. We have that specific roles aligned to value streams Beautiful. and or we are organized around explicitly named value streams. Jeff, do you want to say what you were going to say or do you want to comment on how the poll's going? Well, I was just commenting. It was funny, the the disconnect. I was talking to a, a VP of application delivery at a healthcare company. And um, his comment was, you know, we've started hundreds, if not thousands of initiatives, business initiatives. And he said, from a development point of view, I have no idea even which ones we're still working on. It, it, there's a disconnect yeah. between these ideas that were created and, you know, I, I can't wait for us to get all that connected. It's something that, you know, as a vendor, we're currently working on. It's really mm -hmm. fun to see how it pulls together. Anyways. And this it almost feels like we're marriage counselors in a way, doesn't it? Between, <laughs> oh. I'm serious, between business and tech, they're, they're yeah. how do we, it, yeah, terrible. DevOps was, yeah. was bringing dev and ops together. So we said, right. It was actually different, bigger than that, but the, the, all of this is bringing transparency and getting people to have that conversation together. That that you, that you heard that? <laughs> did you did you have a poker face when he said that? I well, it was hard. It, I don't blame the people involved because there's a different nomenclature that mm -hmm. is used. You know, if you talk to product people or or engineering, I mean, the nomenclature is on out. You know that how many features did you deliver? How many? Mm -hmm. Well, who cares? You know, did this. What, what did this impact the business? Right. I mean, it's not that it doesn't. You... Go here, go though. 34% saying we look to see if the outcomes are as expected. That's good news, right? It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Be nice. Depending, you... depending on how you define that. <laughs> right. Is it, is it, we didn't were those features production? against requirements? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't take down production. That was the outcome. Ooh, Great. <laughs> So we don't have to worry Only about MTTR. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> Only 20% doing value stream mapping. Mm -hmm. Only 9% actively estimating and measuring the value impact of the work. The bottom one is scary to me, Helen. Yeah. We organize ex explicitly around the value streams. They're not naming That's their value streams. So you know what that means? It means that folks are most likely, I'm, I am seeing this, they're still matrixed. 
Um, and so they get assigned over to this product or still called project. They get assigned over to this project for this project to get accomplished. <clears throat> Breaking out of that traditional construct is really difficult, right? I know we always quote Conway's law, but I think it is more important than ever for organizations to truly figure out what the value is, figure out the work that has to get done to accomplish that, and then bend the organization to meet that, right? A reverse mm -hmm. Conway maneuver has got to be at the middle of all this. Absolutely. Let's start getting on some predictions then and seeing how those things align. So, um, since you're on sort of organizational discussion, Tracy, this is a capability matrix. So we have five dimensions. Let's look at the organization one. We're saying here that when people are just emerging, they're starting to use value stream mapping. When they're learning, they're naming value streams and have some roles. When they're practicing, they've got teams that are directed around their value streams and customer journeys. And at the evolving level, all the teams are organized around value streams and dedicated roles. Where do you think people are at? I'm um, going to fall back to uh, industry and domain again. Um, a lot of them are in the emerging and learning when it comes to organizational structures. Organizational change, um, structure um, change is expensive as well, right? It's not without impacts. Um, and so we're in a very interesting time in terms of the financial markets, in terms of those things that are going on with the um, fiscal budgets that are happening. So people want this to happen. Um, but where are they going to spend those dollars right now when budgets are tight? Uh, so I think you're going to see emerging and learning. I, I, I'm going to predict in the next year, though, we're going to see that transition because they can't continue to bleed out. We can't continue to have so many failed projects. The statistics on failed projects are still pretty high, still pretty yeah. scary. Um, well, I heard a statistic recently that I have not validated um, that was pursuant to one area of government where 6% of their projects were successful, 6%. Um, so we can't keep failing or failing to deliver without being able to step on in, into this. Do you want to look at some of the other items that are here, though? Yeah. I love this, I this graphic to, in particular. Well, let's pick on the red one, because I mm -hmm. want to try and bring in William's three questions, because I think the questions are all quite aligned and they're all relating to the tool chain. So I'm going to read out the questions first, and then we can have a, a go at um, aligning them to that red line around DevOps tool chain. So the first question, <laughs> What role can leaders play in making it as easy as possible for developers to be successful at secure coding by emphasizing technology and support systems, perhaps VSM, that integrate into their existing workflow language and tool sets? Second question, could you please share your thoughts on reducing vulnerabilities by integrating them in the defect tracking workflow? So we're seeing workflow, workflow and matching the pace of security bugs, bug fixes to the pace of development. So now we're seeing that we're trying to think of the value stream, pieces of the value stream operating at the same cadence. Mm -hmm. Third question, how can organizations adapt existing secure development lifecycle tools, so existing parts of the tool chain, into the process by shifting them left into small actionable steps that developers and INO infrastructure and operations engineers can take quickly and shifting right to automated tools and responses such as in operations security monitoring. There's so much there, but I think what brings all mm -hmm. those questions together is what William's really asking is how do we bring the tools and the existing processes into a single unified workflow or way of looking at a value stream? Jeff, do you want to kick us off there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. William, 47 topics, spot. if you could just yeah. uh, run on that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on over. We'll talk to you about release orchestration, about starting where you are, really pragmatic approach of taking teams, whatever they're doing, templatize the process, orchestrating and automating uh, bits at a time, using uh, flow metrics, if you will, value stream mm -hmm. flow metrics to make little investments and to identify the investments that the team is going to do in building out not only the product, but the pipeline and the infrastructure that accompanies it. Uh, in your journey so that every iteration that you do, you're making improvements and improving on that. Um, that's what we do as a vendor. So uh, by all means, reach out on LinkedIn and um, we can help you through that. So I want to I address the very first question. What can we do as leaders to help? Um, and we talked, we talked to, uh, William talked about secure coding. So you guys know that I'm an architect, I'm an engineer, I'm hands on dev. I live on that side of the house. Um, we need to stop making our delivery teams 
cyber cyber hobbyists. That's what we're doing to them right now. We're we're asking them to do more and more, and we're not giving them the upskilling that they need so that they have the competency. They're hobbyists, and the reason I say that is not because they're not capable or competent to learn these things, but because they have to go on their own. On the, there's not a budget for them to have the trainings that they need necessarily. Some organizations may have some. But we're, we're adding more and more to their cognitive load. So as a leader, what do we need to do? Understand where they are, understand um, what their needs are and help them, right? The biggest thing we can do as a leader is to help our teams <laughs> to achieve. We're, and we have to provide them with uh, the psychological safe spaces, but with the upskilling that they need just enough, just in time upskilling so that they're not burning the midnight oil to figure out why something is happening. And all the things that Jeff, that you were talking about, are all the goodness that will keep that flowing, but it's a mindset of that leader that they are protecting and buffering and enabling. Jack, True. what else? Yeah, so I, I would actually tie those two together, right? So when it comes to the tool chain, you know, a lot of our teams do have some flexibility. They have the opportunity to use tools that, that they believe to be the right tools to use. But what they can't do is change organizational structures. And so, you know, when we look at the way most organizations that I've been associated with really haven't done that real cross-functional team in that there aren't operations people who are actually a part of that team on an ongoing daily basis. Some places are doing some embedding. They're doing some, um, you know, uh, uh, rotational assignments and some of those kinds of things. But to actually take that plunge and do that cross-functional organization, you know, the, the matrix proved the proof of concept to a point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, we really need to take that next step. And teams can't do that themselves. So leaders have to step in and take the organizational direction and, and really reduce the friction, enable those things to happen so that we've got that true cross-functional approach. And I'd actually, I would actually push back on you on one piece of that. I think it depends on the organization. I've, I'm observing that it depends on the organization. If the teams do have that autonomy when it comes to the tool chains, when it comes to those pieces of it. Um, so there is in some areas, just like I said, that there's a, a DevOps team that's over here. There are some places where that is being mandated. Here are the DevOps tools that you will use. And it is uh, a lot of rigidity. So without the flexibility, they're not even able to adopt the things that are being handed to them. So there's a, there's, this all comes back to something Jeff said earlier. Let's be practical. Let's be pragmatic, right? What do we need to control? Let's worry about that. What do the numbers show us? And do we understand it in context? Because any of the flow metrics have to be understood in the context of that business. If we understand the context, we're able to make changes and affect it. I also and like what Jeff said about the journey starts where we are. Yes. Right. Not right. where we wish we were, not where we thought we ought to be, but mm -hmm. where we actually are. And no shame. Just give a quick time check, people, because we're coming up to quarter two and we do have quite a lot of material to get through still. So just going to bring us back here for a minute. <clears throat> uh, what we have here is an implementation roadmap. We think, remember, we're thinking about predictions. So on the capability matrix, I guess our prediction is that people are going to move up the capability matrix. Mm -hmm. um, here, I think what we're talking about, and this is our um, what Jack was just saying, what Jack was saying earlier, is you start where you are. Actually, you start by setting your long-term vision goals, of course, but then you start wherever you are. This implementation roadmap suggests that people identify their value streams. I think a lot of people are trying to do that now. Um, I think organizing around value streams, we've discovered, is quite rare still at the moment, but probably increasing. And I think mm -hmm. the State of the Report will tell us a lot about that. Mapping, we've established only 20% of the audience today are actually doing value stream mapping. They've got this big step here. This is one of the things that differentiates value stream management today against value stream management 10 years ago because we have the DevOps tool chains that we've spent the last 10 to 12 years building. And even if you don't think you're doing DevOps, as Tracy said, if you're doing CI, CD, you, you've got the fundamental parts of it going on. Then we've got the the capability to continually inspect and adapt once we have automated that. Now, one of the interesting bits here is if we think about predictions, we could predict that people are going to get further along here. I think there's another prediction that more people will adopt Connect earlier. We present this in the implementation roadmap in this way because people like people process tools. But if you've got a DevOps tool chain, you could be doing that a lot earlier and you mm -hmm. could possibly skip that organization step, which I think Tracy 
was just pointing out, it's quite hard for grassroots people in our dominator hierarchies to reorganize. To reorganize to a DAO or a distributed autonomous organization is usually a leadership decision in a dominator hierarchy. So, Jack, what does this give you in terms of predictions for 2022? Uh, so I, I think uh, I'm in alignment with what you were just saying. I, I think we're going to see that connect being pulled forward. Um, and mm -hmm. that may help us drive some of the other pieces, right? That that connection, I think, might help with, you know, people identifying where they could be participating in their not or where they they have input. It may help us to, to organize what we're doing and, and how we're doing it, the teams that we have aligned to that. Um, and, and I think that really that mapping um, becomes much more palatable with the, the newer tools and the increased focus. So I, I think uh, you're right. I'm, I'm on board with you with that connect uh, being. Mm -hmm. So I think Jeffrey is going to be excited about that idea. <laughs> and I wanted to skip us forward to this slide because this is really talking about the nitty gritty of what we're trying to connect here. So Jeff, yeah. what are your thoughts on the DevOps? I, my thoughts are one of the easiest ways to connect teams is to connect their tools. And as soon as you connect tools, you start to standardize some of the statuses and the priorities and the flows and the and so forth. And then the organizational influence, um, what we're seeing is like the teams that are more forward thinking and they're like, oh, well, let's let's automate more, shift more left. We're going to measure the throughput and the value coming through this. We're going to find our inefficiencies. Look how well we're doing. And then that gets to an exec who's like, why isn't everybody doing this? And boom, there you have it. And uh, it's an amazing process that mm -hmm. you, as uh, it, wherever you sit in an organization, can have a massive impact by following the practice. So connecting the, you know, cr connecting the tool chain and implementing that across all your DevOps pipelines, and celebrate your victories, and um, even celebrate the things that didn't work or didn't improve flow. Because hey, that's lessons learned for other people to say it, it's a warning sign. Don't don't do that one. That didn't really help. Um, and, and keep going with it. All these are helpful. Celebrate learning, period. Because what we're trying to do here is measure how fast we can get things through this entire tool chain. So that's our mm -hmm. ultimate our ultimate metric. But Tracy, you talked about flow metrics and contacts. One thing that really fascinates me as a relatively late entrant into the lean marketplace is the difference between the definitions of lean, uh, sorry, lead and cycle time in the market. So mm -hmm. I came up with this thing, which kind of shows us that we've got our design and validate section, we've got our deliver section, and then we've got multiple start points and stop points. So we could start at idea or customer request and finish at customer receives value. But mm -hmm. we look at some sets of metrics, lead time is from code commit to code deployed to production. So there's all these different start and stop points. And I have this vision that we'll have a tool, probably a value stream management tool, that will allow teams to, to literally choose their start and stop points like this and measure in any different way at any point in time, real time dragging the data from the DevOps tool chain. Mm -hmm. Am I crazy? No, actually you're not. It allows people to mix and match, again, to something we said earlier, meeting folks where they are. Um, if they are more focused on the delivery side of it and they need to back up, right, and they need to start to do that, being able to pick the starting places and being able to migrate, right, change that, that workflow, change that measurement, it's going to be a core part of this. We're not doing, we're not making one definition and one metric to rule them all or one set of metrics that are static and that we just implement, right? That's 20 years ago. We're not doing that. We're, we're intentionally reacting so that we can improve. And th this is another way that you'll be able to improve. So I, I agree with this entirely. Let's have a think about this then. So this is about flow. So this is how fast we're moving through the system. But there's this one here, customer receives value. So Jack, what is value? Value depends on who you are. One of my favorite people in the world, uh, and I think, you know, this is Carmen Diardo, and uh, I love to quote him, of what value to whom, mm -hmm. right? Every single one of us has a different perception and set of values. So the more we can share what those are, the more we can expose and, and uh, liberate folks to, to understand our value and to understand we can understand theirs, the more we can help each other get there and, and measure them appropriately. 
This is such an important topic in the world I live in right now. I work primarily with governments uh, and it's not always ROI, but they're trying to, at times they're glomming onto return on investment or money spent, right? There's, we're not looking at revenues. Defining value can be difficult. It, it isn't insurmountable, but you do have to take a step back and, and not adopt somebody else's term, not adopt somebody else's measurement of value. Boy, isn't that true? Um, you know, I'm, I, hey, I, I'm, my day job's a marketing guy. Um, the fact that people came and visited a webinar, awesome. But at the end of the day, what we're all measured on is, is getting deals in the door. Um, I've heard many a salesperson that has talked about, I've had meetings. Well, that's great. What have you closed? You know, what, you know, what, what deals come through the door? Mm -hmm. And understanding that real value and getting the whole team, your product team, mm -hmm. understanding what you all agree on as value will help break down some of the barriers of, you know, well, wait a minute, I've got to make sure this happens. And that's a risk to this other goal. That's not the primary goal. That's where DevOps got its start. Mm -hmm. uh, a con, you know, a contradiction between trying to keep systems up and trying to deliver code at the same time. Well, wait a minute, as soon as we're all in the same line of we've got to deliver value for our customers, now we're on the same page. It's, it's parallel to the conversation that we all have right now as how we work um, our wellness. Um, we are defining our own personal impacts and our team impacts, right? And it's similar to value, right? So I'm not talking about Tracy's only, her value that she's delivered into production, but what's my impact through the efforts that I'm taking? Same kind of thing. Not necessarily how many leads did I turn, because um, that's not where I sit, but was I able to provide that guidance that resulted in something? So how do I measure what those results were, whether it's uh, tangible or, or a slightly less tangible? I love this graphic as well, Helen. This is one that always makes me happy. Talk us through this prediction then. New value stream management roles will emerge. What will they be? Why will they be? Mm, 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 mm. So and the, there's a, a role on, there's so many different roles that we've seen and we're starting to tie them to this, this nice circle. And, and I love that we're not looking at that, that figure eight right now. We're just looking at this continual lather, rinse, repeat, everything feeding one another. The important part for me here is the reintroduction of architecture on the right hand side. Now it shows as part of CI I would actually afford uh, that at the center of this, it's, and you'll see me looking to the right because I'm looking at this uh, uh, just off to the side here, value stream architects. Um, and you see that value stream architects and engineers at the center of this. So while you see them attached to CI, that, that architecture and engineering as a, as a foundational part of enabling all of this is pretty important. But look at, look that there's not each part of this um, it, it tends to silo just a little bit um, when we get over into the more technical side of it. But I'd like to see um, that we have customer success involved, um, where we have BI and big data involved uh, across the entire cycle. So these are, you know, these are not all new roles, but we're not seeing some of the traditional names here anymore, which is a good thing. And we're also going to see folks who are um, wearing many hats athletes, corporate athletes. Um, and so you have uh, product owners, project managers um, that are wearing uh, multiple hats at one time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jack? I, I think that there are some uh, roles that are represented here that I, I'm happy to see because I don't think we considered them in this before. And mm -hmm. there's, there were things that weren't being done. I think that, for example, including folks, whether it's from sales and marketing or legal and, and governance and compliance, you know, this is a, a real realization that this mm -hmm. is a full ecosystem. We can't deal with these as individual bits and that we all have an important role and ensuring that all of this is included in our uh, definition of done. I think is essential. So having this better conversation about what kind of work is there and how are we going to get this done is the real benefit here. Should we have our final poll and ask the audience what they would predict on? So we're going to start polling now. Let me just max that in. So you can agree with us that VSM adoption will accelerate to unstick DevOps, or you could say that we will have clarity and insights into lead and cycle time. 
Uh, more teams will measure value real time. Organizations will advance up the capability matrix. I believe you can have more than one on this poll, by the way. Mm -hmm. BSM platforms will be implemented across DevOps pipelines. A little bit of feedback for the plat big market platform here. It's difficult to read the black on that dark purple. Um, new value stream management roles will emerge. And I have my own. So if you have a prediction that we haven't thought about today that you'd like to share with us, then feel free to pop that in the chat we would absolutely love to hear that jeff what's your favorite prediction um <clears throat> that new value stream management roles will emerge um the point is is as we get more focus here people are going to start to realize that they can have influence um side story um we recently had a product launch about release managers and how they're becoming uh in organizations that were with uh heroes in software delivery who would ever thought release managers? Um, th the world is changing. Um, and the reason it's changing is people are now armed with data and they're getting this mindset of continual improvement and right. data changes everything. It does. Another topic for another day, we'll have to come back and discuss um, data in a, the numbers in a good way and metrics as weapons. They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other day. So. That's why they need to be on the same team. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I tend to agree with you that it's of all of these, they all actually lead towards the role piece here. Um, so you're going to st you're going to see more value streaming happening. You're going to have the clarity into the lead times and the cycle times. It's going to help you unstick that, and there are going to be necessary evangelists and enablers that are going to have to be rising to the top in this. So I love that that question. Final word on that bit for Jack before we pass over to Jeff. Be quick, though, please, Jack. Uh, the only other thing that, that I would add to that is that. Uh, uh, oh, hang on, I'm sorry, I, I just had a brain fart. <laughs> we'll come uh, back to you later. Yeah, you we'll like. come back. I'm yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. I, well, so I like this because of all the problems that we look to address with value stream management, mm -hmm. the things that are slowing you down, um, the silos really fall into two buckets whether it's agile and DevOps or, or agile or DevOps, it's really the ability to have visibility and control. That's what's slowing you down. Visibility across the individual application delivery pipelines. And I'm not talking about from check-in to production. I'm talking about when the thing was first thought about all the way to realizing value. And if you can't see what's happening on a single pipeline, you certainly can't see what's happening at the portfolio um, level. Right. Because at the portfolio level, you add additional things like multiple teams, dependencies, infrastructure, and other kinds of bits that make it happen. Mm -hmm. Well, being that you're talking about multiple teams, you also struggle with um, the various types of uh, tools, technologies, methodologies that fit into that. Some teams work and operate using a different nomenclature than others. Surprise, surprise. And since you don't have any of that and the data comes along with it, you don't have strong methodologies to guide continuous improvement. You need a standard way of doing that. Well, enter value stream management as a platform mm -hmm. to do that. That's what we do. We hook up with where you're at in a very pragmatic fashion, model the processes, give you tools to orchestrate, whether it's the environments, the planning side and connecting it, the uh, deployment and the cutover, the environments themselves uh, from a very legacy point of view, all the way into uh, keeping track what's happening and put that all into a data warehouse and serve that data up everywhere. That's the point of value stream management. We're a cloud-based platform that does that. Um, Transparency and data-driven behavior. What an idea. I, I know. And and the, the point is, is you can start with this now, mm -hmm. right now. You know, I think that these are probably some of the most important slides as people download this content and leverage it um, are slide 20 and 21. And there's a lot of looking at that visibility, understanding the multiple pipelines that are there, um, because that was a beautiful slide about there, because we said earlier, there's not just one pipeline, there are many within an organization. Um, but understanding what a value stream management platform can enable you to do and how you get moving on this. Precisely. One of the things we give you right out of the box is we'll give you value stream flow metrics and your Dora metrics because you kind of need to work with them in tangent mm -hmm. uh, in tandem to work together. Um, I think we actually have a, a book you can download to kind of how do I get started from where you're at today. Okay. Um, by all means, uh, get on that. And well, that's the story. 
and reach out. I mean, uh, all of us are here to help, right? Um, each of us are from coming. Uh, uh, um, Jeff, I know that you're here to right because you're you are a vendor. I'm not. Um, I am paid by Congress to be objective and to provide um, advice to the government and to help to lead in these new methods and and capabilities. Um, and you know. Um, Jack is an entirely different uh, focus, so reach out to us. There's a, a whole lot of sharing that has to happen for us to, to keep moving everybody forward. Amen. Exactly. Well, we're just about at the end of our time. What a great discussion. I really appreciate it. I learned a ton. And by the way, I have checked out that ebook. It's fantastic. So be sure and download it. Great job on that, Jeff, with you and the team at Plutora. And thanks, of course, uh, to you, Plutora, the Plutora team for uh, sponsoring our webinar today. We do want to announce we had some gift card winners. We're giving away four gift cards today. Those winners are Stuart A, Andrew H, Emily B, and Gilbert B. And the folks at Trek Strong Learning will reach out to you about how to get those cards. So any parting thoughts, uh, uh, Jeff, Helen, team, before we wrap things up? Just do just, it. Just do it. I, exactly. <laughs> Don't wait. Get started now. Uh, you don't even need tools. Just get do a mapping session for crying out loud. Then call any of us. We'll get you started. A couple of post-its and a little bit of transparency. Grab some coffee and do it. A little bit of respect and asking curious questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great do it. guidance. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> the do, it. do it, right? All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate your time. We wish you all the best. Have a great week and a great year, great rest of the year. We look forward to talking with you again in 2022 also. Take care. Ciao.